If you are a university or a college, you will have an office dedicated to various terms, either development or advancement. Every school has to have that kind of a program because it's a way of being sure that the school stays in existence, has money enough to continue to last. And also this is true for organizations like symphony orchestras and theaters and all places that can't afford really to pay uh, as the money that comes in will not take care of everything that that organization will need. Um, today, we have the great pleasure of having Bud Chrisman here. And at Mars Hill University, Bud, and by the way, Bud, you've been here 20, almost exactly 23 years. Well, not continuously. Oh, that's right, that was right. the time you were away. But from the, your beginning in 1995. That's correct. I have to ask you first off, this is your job at the university, is of course, uh, as Vice President for Advancement, which used to be called development. I have to start off asking you right away. First of all, I'm going to ask you before that. <clears throat> Tell me how you got Bud out of Harold. I am actually a junior. I'm a oh, JR. Okay. So my given name is a long one. Harold Gannon Chrisman Jr. My father obviously had that same name. He was named after his grandfather's roommate in a trade school. Harold Gannon. Gannon was the last name. And he was always called Buddy. And when I came along, I was supposed to be something else and my mother saw this troglodyte baby come out <laughs> and said oh you look so much like your father we're going to have to call you harold gannon jr and i just got the bud so the first time i ever really heard myself identified as harold was in first grade in mrs bear's class in oakmont pennsylvania and she called the role and she called harold chrisman and I looked around wondering who that individual was. <laughs> but so growing up, I always got Buddy. Uh, my sisters sometimes, even to this day, call me Bud Bud. Bud so. Bud, okay. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful name, it's a very distinctive name, but every doctor's office you go to, you have to identify yourself Absolutely. as Harold. It's really, I have a sunny call in a way because I was called Bobby when I was a child. And then as I grew up, um, you have to somewhere shed. But you didn't share, you kept yours going. I had to get rid of mine. I, I, I have. Um, my father, when he was, he worked for Ford Motor Company, he sometimes in the business world would be referred to as Chris for Chrisman or Hal for Harold. I don't really know why that never happened with me, but. Well, it works. It, it, you know, it's, it's me. So I'm the generic yeah, bud. It's very distinctive. I was amused when I was looking at it some of the information in your background. When I came across your real name, I was thinking I never knew what it was. Okay. And I thought, I'll bet you, I know you married Sally. And I said, I bet you he had fun with the movie when Harry met Sally came out. Did, I, did people talk about that? Yours was close enough. I, I, I've heard that, and of course, many, many um, jokes about Bud Light. Yes. You know, are you the real Bud, or are you Bud yeah. Light? And you know, You're a Bud for life. Uh, hopefully. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, since you mentioned Pennsylvania, I was going to ask you about that anyway. But tell me, I know you grew up in Westchester. Mm -hmm. uh, that was home for you. That's not too far from, for people who don't know, it's not too far from Philadelphia. Right, about Lancaster, 25 miles. From Lancaster and such places. I'm curious to know how a young man who grew up in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. decided to go to Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. um, we had extended family in North Carolina. Um, we're talking second cousins and the life on my father's side of the family. We would come down here, um, not every year, but several times. And I encountered uh, extended family, many of whom had had good experiences at Wake Forest. So that was probably the first time that the name Wake Forest stuck in, in my uh, crawl. And um, it, it, all the, the boxes were checked yeah. at Wake Forest. So that and was I was looking good. for small. I was accused by my, my Yankee family of in mannerism and whatever being more Southern. So you need to go to the South way. anyway. But I thought maybe it probably had something to do with what, what were you thinking your goal in as a career would be? Well, interesting. That, that's, that's a great question, C. Um, when I graduated from high school in my high school annual will attest to this because I had the sportscaster's plaid jacket on. And I wanted to be a sportscaster. Ah. And um, 
if I ever came back, I would probably pursue that. And ended up going to a school that the broadcasting communications program was not really one of their great strengths. Um, and I probably gave up on that a little bit too quickly, quite honestly. But, you know, no regrets no in regret. terms of, of, of Wake. No regrets. Um, you did your undergraduate degree at Wake, and you also did a master's there. I did. And, but the master's was, it was in a different discipline altogether, wasn't it? My undergraduate was in religion, right. and um, my master's was in education, actually with an emphasis in counseling. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you consider being a minister at some point? Because all those lead to... Yes. Because I, I know you went to the Union Seminary. I, I, I did. I, I, um, I often tell folks that I had a call to exploration. Ah. Um, and I had been in higher education at that time probably four or five years and undergraduate in religion, counseling background. Yeah, you're right. It kind of, you know, ties together. Had an interest in that. And I... Uh, so I went to Southern Seminary yes. in, Louisville. in Louisville for a year, had a wonderful academic experience. My roots were Presbyterian, and at that time there was, um, as we all know, a lot of um, controversy and yes. tension Very within tension. the Southern Baptist Convention. And, you know, you kind of walked across campus and you felt like there was crossfire. So oh, yeah. I thought... You know, Lord, maybe a way to solidify uh, the movement from exploration to call to ministry is to transfer to Union. And I spent just a semester there and recognized um, it was a transformational time uh, in this respect. It totally broadened my definition of ministry because I really had ministry and God, for that matter, in a box. That if you're in a church kind of... Yeah, if you're going to be a minister, you're going to be a missionary, or you're going to be a pastoral minister. And I really believe, I hope, um, that what I've done professionally for the last 25 years has been ministry. It's been ministry. All of those prepared you very well for the very first job you had, which was at, uh, at Brevard College, professionally. Um, well, you went there as, as an associate director of admissions, I believe. Um, how... Did you happen to think in terms of admissions, or was that just a job that came to you? Well, the program at Wake um, was generic counseling, but it was it was um, from a vocational perspective often aligned to opportunities internship wide. I happen to do mine more in in school counseling, but some folks were actually doing admissions counseling work and that sounded really exciting and interestingly enough the person who hired me at Brevard College was and I never met this gentleman but he was a family friend of my parents he had been my parents Presbyterian minister early in their marriage okay. and his son was the Dean of Admissions Isn't that at Brevard you, it, it, there's a plan in there so absolutely it, 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 it absolutely you were supposed to be there I think so uh, after a couple of years at Brevard, you went to Gardner Webb for a year. I did. Tell me about that experience. What was? I know you were more, you were in counseling there as well as admissions. Tell me what you did there. Was 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 in admissions. I had been an admissions counselor, ran in and, and developed a really fine relationship with their dean of admissions at the time. His name was Randy Kilby, um, somewhat of an iconic figure in Southern Baptist and North Carolina Baptist life. Randy eventually ended up becoming the president of Fruitland Baptist Bible oh, Institute. Oh, I think it's Randy was the funniest individual I had ever encountered and was probably one of the top two or three public speakers. So I got to know him. He was a bigger than life, and really he was a large man who used to do motivational speaking um, to Fortune 500 com companies, and then he would leave at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and drive four hours across the state and do a church revival. He's that sort of guy. So anyway, I spent a year down there. It was my first year of marriage, and it almost ended up being my last. I say that tongue in cheek, because Boiling Springs, which today is still a very quiet little village, um, but has somewhat of a charm to it. Thirty-three years ago, or thirty, yeah, had none. <laughs> and I was and I was traveling. You, you're a graduate, you know. No, I went. I, I taught there. You taught there. That's right. Five years. So this. So. 
think our paths crossed because no, I was there. I was ahead of you. Yeah, well, you always have been. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, yeah. Now, we're going to talk about age. Um, but no, I agree with you. I, I, I tell this story often. Um, when I went to my interview to teach at, at the college level, it was the job offer was at Gardner Webb. And I went there for the interview. And as I drove out of town, I said in my car, out loud in the car, I said, Dear Lord, if you let me out here, I promise not to ever come back. And of course, I went back and had a great five years. Um, sometimes we don't know where we're supposed to go until we, until we actually it, it, it. Was, it was challenging for Sally um, because I was the very nature of, of student um, enrollment planning and recruitment is you're on the road yeah, all she along. Was and, she was by herself. And, and she was by herself and she had come down from Transylvania County where we were living right. and um, or, or yeah we were both living um, you know single people and she came down to Cleveland County and she was doing the same teaching position as a PE teacher in the elementary school okay but she was getting paid half of what she got in Transylvania County because uh -huh. they viewed it as a, a teacher assistant. Yeah, teacher role. assistant role. Yeah. Uh, you know, we make mistakes about small towns. Uh, it was very difficult for me going to a small town after having lived in big cities, and that was my concern. I thought I might not survive there. Um, but indeed, when you're in, if you you were on the road, and I was busy, was the, I was all the time busy with theater productions, and so sure. you know, we in our own ways we made it work for us. After you spent that year at uh, Gardner Webb, you went back to Bavard, now as the director of the mm -hmm. um, and was there until you took over a, a new job at Allied Homes. Actually, I went from Brevard, uh, my second time at Brevard, to seminary. That's, oh, when, oh, that, to that's seminary. when I went. So okay. I, I went to seminary with about five years of professional experience. So by the time you went to the seminary, you really were in the real world. You were yeah, well, I was in my late 20s. Yeah. Um, it was at Brevard, I believe, that you met uh, Dr. Merrill, Bob Merrill. I did. I, I, I did know Bob and Lois very well. In fact, I was just at Lois's house last week. Oh, good. Um, and my wife uh, sang in the choir at First Baptist Church. And growing up Presbyterian and moving to Brevard and getting to know Sally, you know, the old line, there's more Baptists in Brevard <laughs> than there are people. <laughs> And I actually um, was baptized as an adult at First Baptist Church. And yeah, that's when I first encountered the Merrills. Is it? Yeah, I, he, we did an interview with Bob earlier on because he was chairman of the board, you know, sure. here at one point. And we recently lost him. I, I was a sadness because he had such an important place here at this, uh, at this institution. When you went to the uh, Children's Home in um, 1990, what was going to be the challenge there? That was going to be different for the missions because that was going to be raising money primarily advancement, wasn't it? To totally different. In, uh, I say totally different. There are, there are parallels in terms of relationship building, hopefully conveyance of authenticity, developing trust, so forth, uh, communication-oriented skills. My good friend Mark Bailey, who was the um, VP for development at Brevard uh, when I was there and then has been at Gibbons Estates in Asheville for 30 some odd years, really was my initial mentor in the area of fundraising, development, advancement, and he encouraged me greatly to pursue something. He said, that would be a great fit for you. So that was... Were you surprised kind of, that somebody would suggest that to you when you've been working uh, in admissions? Yes, um, and, and I, I evaluated um, some admissions opportunities. Um, we knew that we wanted to come back to this area. Uh, not that we had been gone that long, only about a year and a half, but you know, the, it got in our soul. The mountains got in our soul. And you're here. And um, Brevard did, and Greater Asheville did. And um, my wife had, um, our kids were very young at that time, so she knew from an um, economic perspective she might be able to get some, cobble together some part time things until she could go back full time when the kids got a little bit older. Right. Um, did you enjoy working in a, a situation where you were? Concern about raising money for special children was that was that a, a new a new addition to your growth as an individual? Your whole concerns is surely. Um, I, I think probably the greatest lesson that was taught there was 
it's very, very difficult to raise money unless the mission of the institution you're representing is secure in your heart to do so. You must be committed to do you, that. You've got to, you've got to believe in the mission, right. and that's got to be preeminent: the mission and then the vision for that particular entity. And and uh, people connect with children, so you know. So it was a good time. It was it was good. I remember when you first came here, uh, Walter Smith, I believe, did an interview with you, and you one of the first things you mentioned in that interview was mission. You were impressed by the mission of what Mars Hill here at that time college stated. Um, and I suspect that that same concept of mission still is with you because you're still out on the road with that mission in the, in the back of your head always in, as you meet people. I, I mean, that, that convergence uh, and, and our good friend Dr. John Wells, former academic VP, said it so well, that intersection of faith and reason. And I think Mars Hill delivers that in a unique manner. Um, and, and the liberal arts gift that we can provide students, I think is very real. Dr. Julie Fortney used to say that that was our gift to students the first two years of the liberal arts. And then what they do with that is their gift back to society. Right. When you came here, how did you, how did you find your way to Mars Hill from Asheville? Um, well, it was about a 20 minute drive. Yes, that's right. right. Every day. You still uh, every day. I'd still do it. Um, I um, had been in a professional organization in Asheville, the, um, the precursor to what is now the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And there were a couple of um, folks from the development program at that time, Chad Ireland and Greg Frady, yes. who I got to know very well. And Greg left, actually, and Chad, Chad left. But they kind of planted the seed um, even further regarding Mars Hill as a, as a good place, as a good community, as a place where you're doing purposeful work. Um, and that meant a lot to me. And then I, I encountered folks on the road when I was doing student uh, admissions. You knew so I knew. Rick I, oh, Rick, was here. Rick, Rick Henshaw, who we called Hooger, Rick and I, um, when I worked at Brevard College my yeah. first year, we actually, it was his last year there, my first, and we shared an office. Right. And he was a newlywed, uh, and his wife was Lou Ann, and he would get on that phone about six o'clock, because we would be making late night phone calls, and he would say, honey, I'm just checking in, Lou Ann, I love you. So every time I see him, <laughs> Lou Ann, I love day, you. I, Lou Ann, I love, I love you. you. Great, great friend. He was, he was good here on campus, too, when he was yeah. here on, on campus. Good when, people. When you came here uh, in 1995, you were director of planned giving, and at that point, it was called the Office of Development. Now, I want to ask you before we talk about what you specifically did, when did it change from development to advancement and why? And it's a, it's a great question, and, and it still is called development in some shops, at some institutions. I was just with a dear friend who's VP of another school, and they call it Vice President for Development. The thinking at Mars Hill, and I think at a lot of institutions, is that advancement is a little bit more inclusive term that takes into account alumni relations, um, corporate and foundation work, plan giving. So, and, and at one time under that umbrella at Mars Hill, it was also communications. Yeah. So um, when you think about it, those are entities collectively that try to move the institution forward, to advance the institution. Right. So the, you know, it's, a more, it's a broader term. It's a broader term. It also suggests movement in a different way perhaps than development. And development, most people think of development as money. And, 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 and that's a big part of what we do. You know, but you know, in order to raise money, you have to have a justification to do so. Right. And some of that is, and a lot of that is um, getting to know individuals and what their aspirations are, what their hopes and dreams are. And then sharing how that possibly could be intertwined with where Marshall University is headed. Did you get to meet Jim Cox before he passed? I knew Jim Cox very well. 
knew Jim very well. Um, when I was at Mars Hill at that time as director of plan giving, he was still doing a considerable amount of development work kind of in in retirement, but you know, did, right. did some work and had a, um, a handful of very important individuals that he kept tabs on, so to speak. And then um, when I came back 16 years ago, um, I would go to West Asheville and we would have good conversations about certain individuals. He had an enormous advantage for anybody in the job because he had been here so long. Yeah. I think mean, he was even in the graduate school, wasn't he? Maybe back in the Graduated in 1943. Yeah, I thought from, that. from Mars Hill. Right, so he not only had gone here as a student, but he knew everybody. He surely did. Uh, and that, that's not, that's the kind of thing you can't really buy. It's yeah. something you accumulate. He was very helpful to me when I first came here. I needed some scholarship money in, in mm -hmm. the theater. And uh, in no time, he had, he had found sources I wouldn't have known where to go to. And uh, so I was always very grateful to him because he had, a, he had a, what I felt was often immediate access to so many places that most people would not have any idea he even knew about. You know? he, he was fantastic for Marcel. Um, he and, and Dr. Bentley, you know, did that's right. worked together. worked together for a long, long time. Sure did. And speaking of Dr. Bentley, it dawns on me, I was thinking about this as I was thinking about today and seeing you. In, in the 20th century, there were only four presidents on this right. campus. Now, you coming up in June, you will have had experience four presidents. You were here, Dr. Bentley was here when you first mm -hmm, came, mm -hmm. then Max Lennon, and then, of course, now Dr. Lunsford, mm -hmm. and then our new president coming up in June. So right. you will have experienced four presidents. That's very, true. Very, very, That's very, true. Very, 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 very You know, not, not extensive You're right. experiences with, with Dr. Bentley. That was his last, last year. year. Right. Um, and then Dr. Lennon, I don't know, might have been a couple of months, something like that, that we worked together. That worked, yeah. Um, so you, you've had a chance to be exposed to presidents who had different styles and, mm -hmm. and what have you in the work that you do. Tell me what planned giving means. That's what you came here to do. What is planned giving? Well, if you think of any sort of gift that requires third party expertise or consultation to complete. And that could be a staff person, but plan gift is, is really individuals that often will get an income stream back. That's in the form of trusts or gift annuities. There are various stripes and flavors of that. A plan gift is an act of intentionality as well that can benefit the organization in the future. So the simplest plan gift would be a bequest. You simply give money? Um, well, well, no, a bequest through one's will. Okay. You know, that I am going to see Robert Jones is leaving 10% to Marshall University, you know, for general purposes, for this scholarship or whatever, or our X number of dollars. So I often tell folks, I don't want to compete in plan gifts at one's demise with family. Just name us last after you have cited everyone else with those specific quests. I'm giving, you know, fifty thousand dollars to this child or whatever, and then the residual of my estate will go to whatever institution. Right. And that has been incredibly. That's been a real blessing to Mars Hill with so many people that have done that. And I bet most people on campus don't know that a great deal of the money that comes in comes in by that route. Yeah. I'm, Many of the largest gifts through the years at Mars Hill have come through uh, estate or plan giving, no question. When you approach someone uh, to suggest that they plan to include Mars Hill in their, in their life planning monies and so forth, how do you know what level at which to approach? Uh, do, do you know specifically what you have in mind? Have you done research? What, how do you do that? Yes and no. Uh, um, we have limited resources, as most schools of our size do, in terms of staffing. So we want to be credible and ethical, and because all of our alums are important. But in terms of how, with you know, a couple of people doing this, um, who do you spend the most time with? Right. 
So we do do some research. We, we have that capacity. Now, we haven't really had that capacity much until the last three years, but we would always still do research in terms of historic giving, um, finding out other boards that individuals might be on and other philanthropic gifts that, that they... Um, so when we're developing a new relationship, it's not, it's just about, Hello, I, I, I know that you are an alum and you think highly of the institution because you sent in $25 yeah. and you do that every year. Um, do you know what's happening? And a lot of it is sharing and updating and getting to know them, asking open-ended questions about them. And then um, when, when you reach a point of, um, of actually asking someone for money, that is the minority, typically, of your times with that individual. It's a lot of listening. The last thing anybody wants is for me or someone else to come in and just um, kind of regurgitate a litany of great things that are happening. I, will I insert that? Yeah. But in terms of where that fits into the, to their life, and there are certain, um, as there are with all of us, there are certain um, benchmark times in our life where, um, as pertains specifically to planned giving, you may um, be thinking about your legacy. You may be thinking a little bit more about your mortality. Um, how do you want to leave this earth? How do you specifically want to uh, help Mars Hill University prosper? So we look at things like that. You know, if somebody's had an illness or they are no longer or have younger kids in their family, that conversation can, um, can begin. And it often begins by something like, see, Robert, you know, as you talk, you may be interested that a lot of people like yourself have elected to perpetuate their current giving by including Mars Hill in the future. Right. And that's really kind of how it goes. I mean, it's, it's a perpetual way to continue to help the institution. I know other people uh, alone that on campus have spoken to me and just informally sometimes and just thrown into the mix that they had seen you when you were visiting whatever town they were in. Okay. And that you had you know had dinner with them or whatever. Sure. So you and you and Dr. Lunsford, all of us become ambassadors for the university. Absolutely. When you think about it. Because wherever we go, we do represent this institution. I think that's hard sometimes for students to realize that they are representatives as well. You know? Yeah. So that people think, well if the school is like that person, I don't want to go there, you know, kind of thing. But um, I, I have been very much interested. I looked to see the kinds of the kinds of gifts that the college has had over the years, and I wrote down some. I want to talk a little bit about these. Okay. The most obvious one is money. Somebody gives you an obvious, you know, you, you send, as you say, a check by somebody or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, the next one is, and this is something I was I knew about, but I don't know a lot about, was insurance that people make the college or the university the beneficiary of their insurance. Um, do, do you have, how in proportionality does the insurance uh, compare to other forms of giving here? It's, um, it's part of the options available. It is not at the forefront of options, but it's a wonderful um, option for an individual who is, you know, 70 plus, and they have a life insurance policy that is paid up. Right. And then they can actually transfer that to the university. So we become the owner and the beneficiary, but it's on that individual's life. Yeah. So it will be fully realized. There are some donors we have right now who have given us life insurance policies that are not paid up but they continue to pay right. the premiums. Yeah. And that actually is a charitable deduction because they'll give us a check for X number of dollars, we'll send it into the insurance company and they get a, a tax deduction for that. Well, he's at the head of the list. You mentioned the insurance was not at the head of the list of the categories. Well, I mean, certainly, um, you're right. Cash is, is at the top. Stock, 
Transferring stock, if it is appreciated, is a win-win for the donor because by giving it, they can bypass the capital gains tax if they were to just cash it, it in. And particularly for older folks, and I'm one of them, but I mean 70 and a half and older who have IRAs, there's, this, there's this thing, that's right, you know. Uh, you probably have heard that from some oh, yeah. of your older friends. Oh, sure. You know, I don't have any of that age um, yet. I, I know. <laughs> you know I, I mean, you're, you're well schooled. But it's called, there's something called an RMD, Required yeah. Minimum Distribution. Year, and folks can actually give up to $100,000, and that is not a taxable event. They don't get an additional tax deduction. But if you pull that out of an RA, you're going to pay tax on it. Right. It occurs to me, as I hear about all these things and read about them, did you have to do any courses in banking and how did you fill in that gap in, oh, was that a gap? I was, I mean, we mentioned our good friend um, Bob Merrill, and when I came to Mars Hill the first time in 1995 as director of planned giving, my uh, background in planned giving was marginal. I really hadn't done much. I mean, we were just peddling as fast as we could at a live home just for annual gifts. And um, there was a, a gentleman at the time by the name of Dr. Tim Siebert, who was not here all that long, who was yeah. vice president. Right ahead of you. And he believed in, in me, and uh, I was sent to the Plan Gift Institute at the College of William and Mary really? for a summer. And Mr. Merrill helped yeah. make that happen. And then I went uh, across um, country uh, to Camarillo, California, to a, a group called Crescendo, who are really kind of the Cadillac uh, software providers of plan giving. So between those two things, uh, I was exposed to some really good schooling and certification sort of program within a short period of time. But the gentleman who Established that plan giving institute at college of at the College of William and Mary was a gentleman by the name of Robert Sharp. He was one of the fathers of plan giving, and he was an insurance guy by background. And he said something that has always stuck with me, uh, and that's twofold: don't overcomplicate it, and if you don't understand it, you can always buy it. You can always buy that information, you know, be it through an attorney or something like that. But um, we definitely, in our relationship with folks, do not lead with that. I mean, it's it's really more about trying to drill down and get to know them, what's important in their life, right. you know, uh, what sort of organizations have they been involved in, and just like just like you would with anybody that you're sure. establishing a friendship. Right. And, and I have been, it has been an amazing blessing to me when you know that you're looked at beyond just the fact that you have a title and you're associated with Mars Hill, but when you get the Christmas newsletter from these people. Yes. And that's, that, that includes is, their family. That, that is, is so meaningful. Right, that it's tells so you that they, they are very much yeah. tuned in. So many. Um, it was, it's, when I read about all these things, I thought, my goodness, if, even if you had been trained in all the things that you've had wonderful education, there would be no way you could know all those things. So, so I, I did not know you had been to those, those research and institute things. That's, that's terrific. Um, talk about real estate. Mm -hmm. People who give real estate mm -hmm. as, uh, as a gift to the college. How does that work? Um, Real estate can be, I mean, it has a lot of different forms. We, there was a time when, uh, when folks were not as well-versed, I'll say, in, in real estate gifts and receiving of gifts. And because of our location, um, there were some landowners um, who kind of at the 11th hour would give, give gifts to Mars Hill, and rightfully so, and the school is like, that's great, we'll take it. And now there are just so many more um, thorough ways to evaluate justifying receiving that gift. So we do an assessment. Um, ideally, if somebody is going to give a gift, 
first of all, you have to have it appraised, right. you know. Uh, ideally, if it's a home, as an example, that person has, a, has, has marketed it, but it has not sold, but there may be a, a, a buyer in the wings, no papers, mm -hmm. and at that point, this is the ideal scenario. That individual would deed it over to Mars Hill. We have a buyer. We sell it to that buyer, and then we we um, recoup, you know, or realize whatever the the value of that that was. Um, you can get into some real difficulty if you accept property. Um, without doing a pretty thorough market analysis. I'm not saying all property that Marshall receives, we have to have a buyer in the wings. That's certainly not the case. But it has to be based upon due diligence with market analysts, i.e. real estate brokers typically, um, how, uh, how marketable that property is. So um, it's a great tool for a lot of people. And, and there's actually a, um, a, an instrument in which folks can deed over to the institution their house and remain living in it. It's a life remainder, and they can stay in it. And do, and do you have do you have that sort of thing? We've had that. that. Yeah, we've had that. I remember back oh well some years ago, and I think this happened before you came here, when uh, the Bruce's mm -hmm. the Bruce farm became a huge gift mm -hmm. to the to the it was then college um, and. I remember Dr. Bentley in talking about this at the faculty meetings would say, we don't know quite what to do with this because we suddenly have a farm and we, we don't, we're, not, we're not in the business of, of that kind of real estate. And yet I know that farm became extremely valuable to, Absolutely. to, the, to, the, uh, to the university because I believe it was during Dr. Lennon's presidency that the farm was sold. That's right. And, and the realtors were Cindy and Steve DeBose. Yes. This would have been about 2001 or it happened just months before I, I came back. Okay. But I kind of was working with them at, at the tail end. And yeah, that, that came at a very, very, very timely time. The, like the college needed the money. It really did. did. Yeah, absolutely. And also the, the farm had always been awkward in some ways yeah. because the college Probably was not ever going to develop it in any right. particular way, or at least I didn't think that was the point. So that was a gift that, that in ultimate terms, helped save. Yeah, it was a seven, a, yes, a very, easily a seven-figure gift that came to. Yes, a very, di in. a very difficult time, and I'm glad that happened. Talk to me about the property that the college owns and leases. Um, that is a great question. That I am actually that's more of a presidential. Okay. Um, situation, but we do have property. We all know the barber shop is one, for example, on Main Street. Yeah. Um, and our philosophy has been, if in most cases, if there is a piece of property contiguous to our our land, we will be interested in it. We're not going to bully people right. in any stretch. We're not going to purchase things at whatever cost, um, but that is a way for us to protect the institution. Right. Um, so those leases on Main Street, um, some of those folks have obviously been there forever. Oh, sure. You know, the, the barbershop yeah, has right. been there for... 1959. Decades. Well, yeah, yeah. And a couple of the other properties around there, when they have become available, we have purchased. The bookstore across the street, um, the former bookstore, right. I should say, the Robinson yeah. property owned, um, you know, that's been a property that Marshall, certainly we would love to have that property, but you know. Has it never been for sale? It, it is actually coming for sale and you know, the school's going to have to make a decision as to whether or not um, that sort of asking price is, is what we want. Occasionally we also run into some folks in which um, a concept called a bargain sale is best. So theoretically, say the property is being marketed for $300,000, we're gonna have $300,000. But if you give it to us for $100,000, you know, we'll actually pay 100,000. And that difference 
is a charitable gift I think, that you can receive. Right. Yeah. I would I would hope in, in many ways that if the property on Main Street, the Robinson property, does become available, that the college would be able to uh, to acquire it simply because the town is so desolate with that property not being used. No kidding. It's, it's no kidding. Now, now the other way to look at that from a town gam relationship, which I think Dr. Lunsford has really developed oh, very yeah, nicely, is whenever uh, the Mars Hill universities of the world purchase a property, if we're if we're putting it into college use, it's no longer on the tax yes. you know, books. But if we lease it, that's a different story. That's a different story. Tell me about gifts that fall into odd categories. For example, um, suppose um, our good friend Charles Tomlinson, for example, mm -hmm. has offered to the college. That, I keep saying college because it will always be college. Of course. Uh, to the university at some point, his marvelous collection of original drawings that he's done for costumes um, and sets for mm -hmm. operas and plays and mm -hmm. so on. How, if, if, if uh, he does indeed offer that, for example, to the university, how, who negotiates that gift and how is it handled? That, that's a great, you and I have had these conversations right. through the years right. and it's, the negotiation has often included now the Ramsey Center. Yes. Because they are going to be ultimately the repository for that. So, um, an actual real life example would be a gentleman down in Texas by the name of James Montgomery. Uh, we have Montgomery Scholars now for regional studies. And um, folks from the Ramsey Center and I, when we recognized that he had, in his case, it was. Um, a record collection and more some of the uh, Bascom Lamar Lunsford artifacts right. and, and music. We, um, we developed a plan together. There has to be, be buy-in from the university that is going to be well taken care of appropriately. It's going to be secured. All of those things that Dr. Karen Parr does so well in the Ramsey Center. Um, in terms of valuing that that kind of depends on what we're talking about as to how it's valued. So you know, there really needs to be an expert third party to, come involved, in to give you know. that. Sort of I mean, thing. if a piece of art, as an example, right. is given to Mars Hill, which is not an art gallery, you know, we're not an art gallery. The value of that gift is really based strictly upon, it's hard to believe, the materials that created the art. So that's nothing, you know. But if that was given to an art gallery, which we can do it if, if it goes into Wiesenblatt, you know, we can, we, right. can, we, can we can do it. Right. So the same is, is same sort of nuances are associated with that. Um, I know that one of the concerns that donors in the past have had here, and of course this would not have anything to do with your office particularly, but it does affect whether people want to leave things is the issue of security, yeah. the issue of uh, protection of humidity kinds of controls, yeah. if those are, are required. And then I know, for example, that some gifts that have been given, because they weren't secured, you know, have been misappropriated or lost or whatever. And that always makes me feel very sad because it yeah. seems to say we haven't cared enough to look out for all these things. Um, do you envision a time when uh, the university will do anything toward uh, I know it's not necessarily in your area, but it really is too. To to add on to the collections that we hold, uh, for example, we, we are now a university versus a college, and a university is expected to have a first class library. Uh, when you are out recruiting, for example, and you are looking for money, do you ever ask um, the, the people that you see, do you, do you have book collections, or do you have things that you'd like to give? Is the university thinking along those lines? Admittedly, it's not at the forefront, but it, it definitely, with certain donors, is front and center. It really, again, for me, it's, it's not a stock question, yeah. but, if, but if there is some sort of collectible or, or whatever, you know, based upon the background, we definitely pursue that, you know. I mean, there's... Uh, folks out there that have, that have given art and that have given books. 
I think you raise a really good question, um, and a really good point, I should say, about university status. It's and, huge. And, and it, it is huge, and I think we have made some strides, particularly in like the President's Lecture Series, that's something that a university does to enrich the community, to um, allow the larger community to know that we are here and we are an active partner in your lifelong learning as well, even if you're not a student. I think there are multiple opportunities like that. So, we'll be judged, you know, I think, by accrediting agencies, if nothing else, yeah. by the holdings we have as in, in our libraries, for example. I know that times are changing with electronic media, right, but yeah. nevertheless, you know, Yale becomes important because of the holdings it has in its wonderful libraries, as institutions are everywhere. Uh, and, and we are well aware that, um, well, I'll just give you an example. I was in California, um, this was years ago, I was at the University of it was the University of Santa Clara. I think that's correct. And I was visiting with an alum, and he he was an adjunct English professor, and he introduced me to one of his colleagues who had been in our archives uh, the summer before. So he knew what we had. Doing, doing research, and I think, I think it was, I, I don't know if it was on Bascom, but it was somebody, you know, that we all would be familiar with. And that becomes, it, it, for us, it becomes a validated fact for our, for our own status as a university. Um, I'm very much aware of these things and very much concerned that we don't lose that as the colleges and universities moving forward, you know, as it grows. Let me talk a little bit about, uh, there's a, you, you mentioned this earlier, but it seems to me that since you have been in development, now advancement, that your office has taken on a bigger job than you might have expected it to have when you came here. Uh, for example, alumni has always been around, but not always housed under your direction. I think it was sometimes at separate places, but now the alumni uh, program, all of those things is housed under your, mm -hmm. your purview. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, that's huge all by itself, because you're dealing with uh, alumni relationships, you're dealing with alumni dinners, you're dealing with all kinds of things. Right. How has that changed your work? It really, it, it's changed it in certain ways in that I think we are more, I'll use again the term I like to use, we're more intentional, we're more purposeful because we want alumni to certainly um, get back together for events, for reunions, for gatherings in Winston-Salem or Charlotte. Um, and, and why do we want to do that? Well, we want to do that because it's A, the right thing to do, B, it um, affords those alums to kind of get warm and fuzzy again, to rekindle some important memories of what this place meant in their life. Um, and I would be less than forthright, and you know, there's Dan Rather and CBS here, but um, we have skin in that game because our, um, our most passionate, most benevolent individuals, um, for the most part, are our alums. I mean, they're the ones that have the real life experience. So, for us to be able to have forums, opportunities for them to get together, to be brought up to speed on the relevance. And I think that's another thing alums want to know is that the, the height of Mars Hill University, historically, while it was most meaningful during their four years personally, they don't want that to be the height of the institution. They, they want to be assured that there is a vision moving forward that Mars Hill is, it's not the same as it was in 1959, 
And, and I, I tell folks, you know, in, in a kidding way, but they know you really don't want it to be the same no. in 1959. Because, you know, if it, if it was, you know, it would be called extinct. <laughs> it would be called extinct. I mean, it really would. Everything has got to be, um, so that fabric of our mission and our legacy and our history has got to blend together 40, 50 years down the road. But the manner in which we deliver Christian education is different today. Yeah. It, it's, it's just it's different. different. But, they, but they want to know, uh, and rightfully so, that there will be a tomorrow for Marcy. Are there, how many alumni chapters are there? There are no alumni chapters. Is that by design? Or That's by design. Um, there, um, there was a time when that was very much in vogue. It still is very much in vogue at large, you know, you know sure. with huge alumni staffs oh, yeah, sure. and things like that, you know, where those folks can, can do that. We have gone, and, and, and that's actually really timely because we're actually revisiting that possibility. But as folks are less inclined to be joiners, you know, we see that, don't we, in church, we see that in civic organizations, on down the line. Yeah, count me in for a four-week Wednesday night study, but I, you know, I'm not going to obligate myself for you know, the year sort of thing. And we have, um, we don't have all the answers to this, but we have done more identification of kind of primary and secondary, and you know, you might even say third or tertiary sort of areas that are dependent upon the demographics, upon the concentration. So we will have uh, gatherings in Charlotte or Greenville, South Carolina or Raleigh or the Triad on an annual basis, but then we might go to Knoxville every two or three years. Um, what we have done uh, in the last couple of years, and we're really kind of at the infancy stage of this, because when do most of these gatherings take place? They, you know, they'll typically take place at lunch. Well, if I'm a 35-year-old CPA, I can't necessarily break away for two time. hours. Yeah. Um, so we are really trying to identify opportunities, and, and it gets back to um, reaching out and, and trying to uh, to identify a leader, a, a cheerleader in that particular area and, um, and give that individual the resources and the support to help make it happen. So, um, you know, so we'll, we'll get um, 50, 60, 70 folks out of Charlotte. We, we have had um, ones in which, you know, there might be 10 or 12 individuals. Um, so probably not the concentration of folks that merits, you know, the old time, but you know, talk of a, of a chapter, but some of those larger areas, I think that that is something to revisit. But the advancement office also, because of the fact that they run down now in that area, which is you, you, you are charged in a way, uh, in a very good way, because you have to plan alumni banquets, you just, you, your office are also dealing with the alumni of the year kinds of things. Absolutely. And that takes on an enormous amount of planning to do, just bring those up. Let me ask you, uh, I thought I remembered well, that earlier when I first came here that the alumni banquets every year were scheduled usually around the homecoming weekend. Mm -hmm. And those those events, the, the, the big alumni uh, uh, banquet was for all classes, whereas the small reunions for the class of whatever year would be held separately around campus. And that doesn't seem to have evolved today. Was there a reason for changing that? We, um, there was a long period of time in which we were trying to do, and not doing it as well as we could, we were trying to be all things to all people. And, and by that I mean as much as I would love to sit here and say, yes, we're going to have significant, impactful five-year reunions every, every five years. Um, the reality is where we are right now at Mars Hill in terms of uh, available boots on the ground, so yeah. to speak, yeah. um, 
we did not do that very well. We, uh -huh. we, we did not because it was not staffed and organized and it because you, you alluded to the fact it takes a lot of time to look at you know okay who is in that five-year class who are the four or five or six individuals and if those, it's not them to get together to create a committee and what do they want so we've tried to be there's a lot of reunions we are well aware and it's a great thing that occur, you know, and it oftentimes will be affinity oriented. It might be the sorority, right. and they get together, or former basketball players, and they get together. And we certainly want to be at the ready to be a resource to them. We we centered more on trying to do um, and to um, to to not just be a resource, but to really be a presence with starting with the 50-year reunion class thing, that's, that's not the ideal because you want to have had all those others yeah. leading up to that. That's right. Well aware of that. And we're actually now in a period of, okay, we've got that. That's been retooled pretty well. Um, and it, was, it, it went along swimmingly for years with the junior college era. And then I would say the first five or six years of the senior college era, it was pretty hit or miss right right then. And now we're back in, you know, they're growing and we've, we've backtracked. So last year we started a 40-year reunion, which went very well. Um, both campus organized events and then off campus events, because sometimes folks, and this year we're adding 25. I would love if we do this again in five or six years to say, yeah, we're, we're able to do every 10 years and do it well. Um, it, it is, um, it's, it's really important and you're absolutely spot on by saying it is to do it well. Exactly. We, it, it, it's time consuming. It's very time for, for us to have a five year reunion as an example, you know, 15 year reunion or whatever. and and have it in a classroom in Cornwell, which we did, um, you know, that, is that really, does that justify, right. you know, when three people show up? I guess, I'm, I guess I'm thinking as you're talking that it may be to accomplish what you want to do in a, now in a university setting, that there either needs to be more staffing or a different approach to how it's organized. Because your office is saying that's handful, your hands full, just doing the, the advancement money things that you must yeah do. I mean and, and we definitely um, Amy Garrison and alumni relations folk um, I mean we're we're all together so I mean we are at all the same meetings together and it's it's really indistinguishable when John Chastain who uh, does good good work with donor relations and um, is looking at those individuals that are you know in his grouping to identify and, and work with um you know there, there's bantering back and forth between that it's good that person they're, they're and they're it's, it's got to be it's got to be it's got to be because you're all right there in the same yeah. suite which is great in addition to that event of those events alumni events you also in your office have an annual donors dinner which is a huge event just by itself. It, it, that, we, we implemented that about, it's been about 15, 16 years ago. And um, that's a fantastic event. Um, it's a recognition opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to say thank you um, to a larger audience. And the, the and those are very well attended. I they, they're are, well attended, they're about 250 folks. Yeah. And, you know, and, and frankly, the, the target population are those, um, you know, no, no secret here, are those that have given sure. a minimum of $1,000 the previous year or $10,000 in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that obviously ebbs and flows as to who. And then they're also within that certain awards, you know, philanthropists of the year, or we might have a trustee who really takes seriously their fundraising responsibility. So we actually have a fundraiser of the year. It could be the individual who is leading a 50-year reunion in terms of their 
the union giving, something like that. But so it's it's a wonderful time to show appreciation, but also it's a wonderful opportunity for folks to look around the room and say, this is an important viable endeavor, and I'm not the only one supporting it. That's right. That's really really important. Um, I'm always very much aware of those because I'm aware of how complicated it is not to get all those people together, but to plan a program <laughs> that's going to be fun uh, and it's also laden with a message you have to give. Sure. That's part of it. Everybody does that. Um, let me ask you about something totally unrelated to any of this. Um, years ago, when I first came here, uh, there was an upset on campus. Um, I don't know which department it was. was going to apply to the Kellogg Foundation, I believe it was, for a small, yeah. for a small grant. Okay. And at the same time, unbeknownst to anybody, Dr. Bentley was courting the Kellogg Foundation mm. for a huge grant. Mm. And he discovered that, indeed, the, the department, was another department was looking for something small. And at that point, I believe there was a discussion campus-wide that all grant from, at that point on would even though it might, be, it, might, it might have been generated by the departments or whoever, would go through a central grant writing place. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's part of your office as well. It is. That's in itself a huge yeah. component because somebody is writing grants. I'm presuming that's an ongoing thing because you're looking for money for all kinds of different things. How is, tell me how that works. Th that is, and, and, and you hit on something that was um, kind of a, a, a stumbling ground for, for many folk is probably turned in just the opposite direction in this respect. Um, whereas um, a professor with all the right intentions um, pursuing a grant on their own kind of in a, in a unilateral manner, now we do ask them and there is a process of communication with academic dean folk and the advancement office to make us aware of what. Mm -hmm. So that is still occurring, and, and I think it's a little cleaner. It's not to say that occasionally that doesn't still happen, but it's, it's less likely. What's more likely is that um, through our grants program, information about a potential funding stream is being sent out to certain faculty members based on their discipline from our office based upon a potential connection there. So some, some grants themselves are written out of our office. Um, all of them to some degree are reviewed, analyzed, edited, budget tightened, you know, coordinated. We're, as, as you and I speak here in early 2018, we're in the midst of tra some transition there um, because our corporate foundation person full-time is no longer, but she is still doing that on a very um, part-time contract and she's done great work. She's still, right, right? She's still, she's still very available. I mean, the faculty uh, during Dr. Lennon's administration in the late uh, 90s were conflicted because he was very much in favor of the faculty getting out to meet industry to find money to help yeah. support their programs. Mm -hmm. And we had all been so chastened to not do anything like that right. because it was going to be at cross purposes. So there was for at least a time there some awkwardness about uh, different departments yeah. going out to find their own funding. Right. Um, so that, in other words, that becomes a huge part of the the work that you do because you're going to get grants from foundations which are not always people you can go court personally as you do people, That's right. uh, individuals. And, and that whole arena has changed um, the, the, the grant seeking uh, industry, if you will, or compilation of foundations has changed somewhat. It used to be that you could truly develop a personal relationship, and we still do, but there are a lot of um, foundations as the needs and the expansion of nonprofits has occurred in, in America in the last you know, two decades in particular. A lot of them, in order to do their work, they can't 
have Bud Christman say, you know, Mr. Um, A.V. Davis, I'm going to be in Jacksonville, Florida, and, you know, could you see our president in me next Tuesday? That still happens on, on some occasions, but there's less of that. Sometimes you have to send a preliminary request that they review and then they give you the green light or not to pursue a full-blown proposal. When the accrediting agencies come to campus, are you considered in the bailiwick of their, do they kind of look at you? They, they do from this regard, see. Um, I put together an organizational plan annually and they want to see that. They, they want to see that we're not just making this up. They, they do want to see some data Certainly, which we can provide. So you do have to provide it. Yeah. And you do meet with those people. Um, if if I were to send you here in uh, 2018, and you've been here then, as we say, an accumulated number of years, yeah, right. um, clearly you have a vision for what your area in advancement, what, what is your vision for advancement that's not happening now? Oh, wow. I have to answer this in light of whether I want to come back to work tomorrow. <laughs> I'll just tease you, can be, you can be on it. No, um, yeah, nobody's going to see this, right? Um, well, I, I would say this. I mean, and, and we've already talked about it. Um, there is a direct correlation between boots on the ground, be they associated under the guise of alumni relations, or fundraising and return on investment. And, and I do think that those institutions, uh, and Mr. President, if you see this, this is not anything you haven't heard before. Um, there is a correlation between funds raised and, um, and staffing, um, if you have the right staff. Now, numbers in and of themselves don't mean anything. If you, have, if you have the right people. If you have the right people. Yeah. And, you know, and I think as we enter into this exciting new phase of a university, uh, my observation has been, and, and I've heard, I, case in point, um, as Dr. Lunsford often says, um, I had a phone conversation last week with an alumnus of ours who's actually a trustee at another institution in this state, you know, well, well known, but pretty comparable in size sort of institution. And he was just kind of asking me about staffing issues because there was a proposal at that school to basically, I mean, it sounded like it was going to be doubling. And um, so, so the schools that, that are recognizing, and, and we do, there are two primary um, funding streams at a school like Mars Hill. And first and foremost, it's our students. You know, if you're just gonna look at it from a business perspective. Um, so then you have to look at and say, well, how much of, of the sticker price are you actually going to charge once scholarships and other awards are made? And what does that mean? And then advancement. Admissions is always gonna be your number one because we have all felt it you got to have at Mars Hill, you know, if we're, you know, if we deviate by 10 or 20, that, that, that has an impact, doesn't it? You know, it really does. Sure. So, so the point is merely, you know, issues of numbers of recruitment uh, from admissions and retention. I mean, these are obviously hot buttons, Mars Hill and everywhere. Um, so what does that look like in terms of steady income? And then if we aspire to do more, what does advancement look like? So, um, so I mean, I think that there is an opportunity. I think there is an opportunity um, as you move into university to, to even look at different disciplines, to look at athletics, you know, and the nuances of particular types of fundraising relative do to Do you have difficulty raising money if it's if it c comes down to the bottom line for some area of the university which may not be in the forefront of public interest. Uh, you know, one of the things I heard all the candidates for president talking about was the difficulty in, some, in phasing out departments or in phasing out programs that are not 
no longer germane to contemporary society or not as as important as they were because of technology and so forth. Right, right. Um, do you have difficulty sometimes if, if, if someone comes to you on the campus and says, we need help? When you go out and look for money for those people, do you find it difficult because of who they are? Do you have to justify it? Does that come up there? It's, it, it's interesting. There are certain disciplines that lend themselves, particularly within the alumni world, to obviously being higher compensated. I mean, it just, that's just the way life is. Yes. So if, if you are a graduate of a humanities-oriented, I'll say, I won't say it's specific, you know, type discipline, and, you know, there is a fundraising initiative there, we have to be a little bit more creative in, because it's, it's not, and I get this sometimes, well, why, can't you just look at all the humanities majors and send them a letter? Um, well, yeah, sure, we could, you know, and, and that's not to say we won't at some point at the tail end of whatever that fundraising initiative is, like we're wrapping up our current building our university campaign, we're doing that in athletics right now. But you, fundraising 101 is you have got to get some flooring gifts. So we have to be a little bit cre more creative in who those individuals are. Maybe their spouses yeah. have done well, or that's where... Um, in certain disciplines, certain foundations are going to be more of the lead gifts. And your staff, by virtue of who they are and what they do, absolutely has to know this campus cold. The program's solid. They can't go to somebody and somebody ask a question. And they can't say, well, I have to go back and check and see if that's what we do on okay? campus. You can't do that. I don't believe can you can't not, not quite as, as, as you articulated it, but um, it's, it is kind of fun sometimes and, it, and it's exciting if I don't know, you know, I will share, this is my understanding of that, this is my understanding of their priorities, but let me check on that. And that's a good thing from where I come from because that gives me another reason to have a contact with that right. individual or that person. So um, it's just like um, I, I tell our, our our staff members, and they tell me sometimes, uh, I don't need to uh, to give you a huge folder with stacks of material. Okay, I, I mean, I, I'm going to give you some information, but I also don't know exactly what kind of information I need to be giving you, particularly if it's the first time I've ever met you. Um, and again, it um, it provides a legitimate reason for me to say, see Robert, it was great talking with you uh, two days ago. Just wanted to call and let you know I talked to, um, to Neil St. Clair and this is what's happening in theater arts, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, or this is the material that I found that I think would be helpful. Here's information on that IRA transfer and that required minimum distribution that we just talked about in theory before. My guess is that the work you do is not work you can leave here at 5 o'clock when you go home. Not usually. And it, it's really interesting. Um, that, it, it, short, <laughs> short answer is, is no. no. And um, I'm a morning person, so that's kind of good. Uh, not that I'm here as, because I live 40 minutes away. And that's, yeah. that's been a challenge. But, um, so that's good. You know, I actually like to get there, you know, before everyone else does, and, and that, that's a good time of concentration. Um, what I was going to talk about was um, when I was in seminary, and we've all done the, the Myers-Briggs, oh, yeah. you know, and extroverted and introverted, and I am I'm definitely a people person. I'm, I'm more on the extroversion side, but I'm not over here. So when you say at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, a lot of events, you know, occur at night and weekends and things like that. Um, but those, those both energize me, inspire me, and I'm also a personality that once that event is over, I need some bud time. 
I really do, to fill my cup back up. And I know baseball is one of those things that... Oh, gosh, yeah. Now we're talking. Then we're talking. <laughs> and the Phillies going to do anything this year? Phillies are, are, you, I would not bet the farm. You can give the farm <laughs> okay. to Marcel, I wouldn't bet the farm. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Philadelphia sports fan. So. Did you go, when you were a kid growing up, did you go to that games? I, I had a, a wonderful father and grandfather too, um, and they were big sports fans. And um, I, I've, I've shared this story with many folks, but my first exposure, my dad was a big baseball fan. Um, and let me also say, it's really easy to be a fan of Boston sports when they win. It's really hard to be a Philadelphia sports fan. It's also hard to be a Wake Forest fan. I was Stephen Deacon. I was um, but so my first exposure was just watching like little black and white games yeah. with my father on a TV yeah. about this and I'm five years old and uh, and that was an indelible memory um, I turned six and he takes me to what was then the the stadium the baseball stadium Connie Mack Stadium it, it, it's not that anymore it's something now it's well like, there's been two stadiums it's, it's, since it's, then right. you know the Connie Mack Stadium was the first steel and concrete stadium of its type built in 1909 and as Philadelphia changed, the neighborhood around it really was kind of dangerous, kind of had gotten dangerous. So it was one of those neighborhoods in cities, and we, we all see them, particularly, you know, 40, 50 years ago, where you park on your street, little kids come out and say, I'll watch your car for a quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the game's over, and they're nowhere to be seen, but you do that. So yeah. we did that with this first game, I'm age six. And I'm hand in hand with my dad, and my binoculars are bouncing up and down. And we walk into the stadium, we were seated, I don't know, 10 or 15 rows back. And I'm just looking at my seat, you know, and I sit down and I look out. And the first thing out of my mouth to my dad was, hey, it's in color. <laughs> I've never seen oh, anything in color, color. before. <laughs> and, and honestly, that. Um, Baseball's a metaphor for life, so I mean, I think that has that started a lifelong affair, and I've been to every Major League Baseball stadium in, in America, except for the one closest to us, which is in Atlanta, the new it's one, new, yeah. which we are going to check off right. uh, the first home stand. Right. I know that the ladies in your family, Sarah and Rachel, are sports fans. Did they ever resent? Did they ever resent times when you were not there for them? Like, for example, when you were doing all these university things out, going to meetings and so forth. Did they ever? Is it now? Were you, were you ever aware of that? Um, I, I do know, in talking to Sally, my wife, that it seems like whenever I was gone, those were, those were critical times because uh, I can distinctly remember her calling once, and I'm in California, and she said, Sarah doesn't believe in Santa Claus anymore, you know? And she had to, she had to deal with that. She had to deal with that. Um, back when, when I came back to Mars Hill under the Lunsford administration, 2002. Um, I, I was not the vice president. Um, Dr. Jerry Jackson was the interim vice president, who I never knew, and he's the one who actually hired me back. And um, we had a delightful relationship, and um, he's, he's now gone to his just rewards. But um, within a relatively short period of time, he, um, he, his health was not great, and I was, became the in charge, the senior development director. And this was once Dr. Lunsford was solidified as the permanent president, I was, um, I was given an opportunity to pursue, and several trustees were very supportive of me becoming the vice president. And I chose not to at that time, because I knew, uh, at least I thought I knew, um, what it was going to entail and my kids were still a, in the home, they were young, they were athletes, and I wanted to be a presence. I wanted to be the dad that went to that soccer game in Concord. And, um, you know, they both played travel soccer, and I wanted to be a part of that. So um, the timing could not have been better, and by the time they really kind of phased it, well, graduated and gone on to college, was when the second opportunity 
came about. So you, you made choices that were important family-wise. They, they, they were really important to me, yeah. One quick question before we quit, before we stop. Uh, we have a new president coming in June mm -hmm. the 1st. Yeah. If you could, in one sentence, tell him what you think he ought to know about your area of the university, what would that sentence be? Make it a priority. <gasps> that, uh, make it a priority. I think we have, uh, and I think all of our candidates um, could be really good advancement individuals. Uh, and, and the president coming in has great authenticity, sincerity, um, he's bright, we need to and, send and, and, and it's really, really important. I think it's really easy, I should say, for presidents to um, to get caught in the weeds and they need to know the minutia but they can't and, and others have and I have talked about this recently um, but they also need to be the one more than anybody on a campus that has the liberty to go to the 30,000 foot level um, and to recognize in partnership that this is our vision, here's the buy-in, and will you partner with me? And um, the schools that are making strides in the area of fundraising, um, that's happened. And that, that we've been blessed because Dr. Lunsford has made that a priority. Right. You know, he, he's made that a priority. I want to thank you for your support of the Memories Collection. I know that your office has been very gracious to us in seeing that this project continues. And I'm very, very grateful. And thank you for taking time to talk about what you do. I am honored. I really am. You're one of my favorite people uh, on this campus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.